All right, well, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 8 through 13 today. We're going to finish uh, this chapter. We've been looking at this chapter for a while now. Uh, we've, uh, we kind of slowed down the process. Usually we've been moving at a bit of a quicker pace, uh, but we're, we kind of slowed down 1 Corinthians 13 because the whole chapter is on love, and what, a, uh, what an appropriate passage to be talking about in the season of life that we're in. So each week we've been looking at kind of like a half sentence almost, and now we're going we're gonna to cover several verses and finish up this thought on love that Paul gives to us. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 8 through 13. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall see, even as I am known. And then verse 13, which I think is a really important passage or verse, maybe one of the most known verses besides John 3.16. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So I want to look at this passage, love never fails. And I want to kind of remind you just for it matters. Like the book of 1 Corinthians, you can't take like one verse out of the rest of the verses. They're all, they all move and work together. There's this, this harmony that happens. In chapter 12 and in chapter 14, Paul is writing to us about the gifts of the Spirit. And if that's like a new idea and you weren't with us earlier, maybe go back, listen to our, our messages on 1 Corinthians 12. There are there are giftings that God wants to give to you and to me to be who he wants us to be here in this world. Gifts of faith, gifts of mercy. And we looked at several, we looked at many of these in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is why I called this series CrossFit because it's about putting your faith into action or into motion. But here's the thing. It's possible, and in fact, we see this in the book of Revelation, it's possible to have faith that's in motion, but be missing the engine that should be moving your faith. Sounds ironic, but it's possible. You see, it's possible to get something going and then just let it go, but no longer be operating in that same power that we're meant to be operating in. Here's what I mean by that. 1 Corinthians 12 is faith in motion. 1 Corinthians 14 faith in motion. 1 Corinthians 13 is all about love. Why? Because love is what must center our lives. Love is the anchor. Love is what we're to be tethered to. God's love, not my idea of love, not what I feel, not that feely-feely kind of a love. Nothing wrong with that, but he's talking about something that comes from God that we experience in our lives and then that we get to give out to others. Not the kind of love where it's like, oh, I love you because you're on my side or you're on my team or I agree with you, but the kind of love that comes from God. And that kind of love, Romans tells us that God's love, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. So God's love is, it transcends the emotion of something and it moves to something so much deeper, something so much more eternal. So God's love is supposed to be, let me even re-say that, it must be the center of our faith in motion. And in Revelation, we see a church that was active. They were involved. They were invested. They were, they were doing things. But Jesus himself said, this is the thing that I have against you. You left your first love. And Paul in Rome, and 1 Corinthians 13 in the verses 1, 2, and 3, we looked at this several weeks ago. He said, if you don't have love, you got nothing oh, but I've been really, like, I, I led 20 people to Christ. But if you don't have love, your actions 
don't matter. It's not the same thing. And so we are centering ourselves and we're to center ourselves in the love of God so that God's working in and through our lives has a focal point, has a, a foundation. My actions are grounded on the love of God and on his work in our lives and upon the cross. So Paul says this, kind of a concluding thought to love. He's given us all these different thoughts for love. Most of them are what love is not. 1 Corinthians 13 is not the description of love. It's more of a, it more identifies what it is not. But here, Paul says this, love never fails. The other way to say that is love will last forever. Love lasts. Love never fails. God's love never fails. And so um, I want you to notice in English here, there's several different words Paul uses. Look at back in verse 8, love never fails. But if there are prophecies, they will fail. If it is tongues, it will cease. Whether it is knowledge, it will vanish away. So in our English language, there's several different like ways of saying something that Paul said it a little differently when he wrote this. In our English Bible, we just say, you know, vanishes or will never vanish away or ceases or fails. But what Paul said is this. Paul said, love will last forever. And then he said this, prophecies, and here's a, here's a great way of looking at it. Prophecy will be put on the shelf. And then he says, knowledge will be put on the shelf. And I want to talk about both of those in a minute. But in between that, he says, tongues will cease. Literally, like, will stop at some point. Now, I, I'm going to talk more about tongues next week, but it's worth it to kind of give just a couple ideas right now. And if it's a, like, what does that even mean when he just says tongues? Like, are we talking about our tongues? In the book of Acts, we see, in, in Acts chapter 2, we see God pour out his spirit upon the, the first disciples. And as they, were, as they were praying together, God pours out his spirit and they began to speak and to pray in different, the Bible says, tongues, different languages. And a whole bunch of people from around Jerusalem gathered together and they could hear them speaking in their language. So people from all over the world were like, no way, I understand them. And then somebody else from another place was like, I understand them. And then we see later, and we'll see it a little bit more in 1 Corinthians 14, we see Paul describe that God wants to or is willing to gift someone, a Christian, with the ability to pray to him in a language unknown to them, but known to God. And if that doesn't make sense, you have to come back next week. There was my plug. Did I hook you? There you go. But God wants to, God gives to some this a gift, this ability to pray and speak in a language they don't understand, but that God does understand. Historically, from the time of the book of Acts, we see all the way through the book of Acts, we see, we see this gift of tongues happening quite a bit. And then the disappearance of those things for most of church history. And it's been about the last 150 years that we saw a resurgence of the gifts of the Spirit and including the gift of tongues. And that's why many people, when you talk about the gifts of the Spirit, will say, oh, I don't believe in those anymore for today. Where does that come from? That comes from right here in 1 Corinthians 13. It's, I think, misguided idea, but here's where it comes from. Notice in verse 10, he says, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And many people believed once we got the whole Bible, once it was all written down, the Bible is perfect. Once we got the Bible, we don't need any more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Problem with that idea, well, can I just mention one? There's a few problems with that. But the one that's maybe the most is that he goes on to say in verse 12, we see now in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. 
Paul's not saying once the Bible is done, there'll be no more gifts. Because I'm thankful that God still gifts people with the gift of mercy. I'm thankful that God still gifts people with gifts of helps and teaching and prophecy and knowledge and wisdom and all these. I'm thankful for that. Healing and tongues. So we don't believe that when the Bible got done being written, that all the gifts disappeared. We believe that the gifts of God are still here, very present, very real for our lives today. So what does he mean when he says when that which is perfect comes, then that which is, is temporary will be done away? Here's what it means. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about when Jesus comes back, and we talked about it Wednesday night, and raptures us, or when you die and you go to be with the Lord forever. One day, either we're all going together or we're going to go one at a time through the process of life. You're going to be before God and you will no longer be needing to pray in tongues. That'll just be done. There'll be no need for that. Now, Paul also says prophecies will be put on the shelf. Knowledge will be put on the shelf. Let me explain. Prophecy is when you speak the, the heart of God. It can be for the present or it could be for the future. Some, the prophets spoke about things that were going to happen in the future. God still does that. But most often, God speaks through prophecy in the right now, in the moment today. But notice what Paul says. These will cease or be, excuse me, be put on a shelf and knowledge will be put on a shelf. What does he mean by that? I, I could use myself as the easiest example that I could think of for this. Are you ready? One day, we're going to be in heaven together. Amen? Okay. I will not come up to you and say, I really want to teach you a Bible study. I'm not going to be teaching Bible studies in heaven. Amen? You don't have to say amen. Don't do that. That's mean. But do, do you see what I'm talking about? You're going to know. Somebody's going to, not going to come up to you and say, hey, I've got a prophecy for you. I have a word from the Lord for you. You know what's going to happen? The Lord is going to step in and say, I'll give that word. I'm right here. No longer is God going to be working through other people to be speaking to so many of us. Nothing wrong with that. I'm thankful for that. Anybody else in here thankful for when God will speak through people to our lives? I am. But I look forward to the day when I don't need them. I don't need a middleman to have, I mean, face to face. Now I see dimly, but then I will see clearly. Oh man, I just need a moment with God. Let's go. God's ready. That's heaven. Heaven is not just proximity or location. It's also a, a healthy biblical perspective that I will be, you will be with God forever. That's heaven. And so I want you to imagine that what Paul is saying here is he's saying, I want you to understand why love is so much better and so much more important than all these other things. And here's the most important reason why. These things are going to stop, but in heaven, love will never stop. You will never stop growing in the love of God. You're not going to get to heaven and Jesus gives you a big hug and you're going to just cry it all out and be like, okay, now I got it all. That same thing will probably happen. And then like, you know, I mean, you know what Ephesians 2 says? In the ages to come, we're going to learn of the kindness of our God. In the ages to come. Imagine that. There's only so much knowledge that's out there. And by the way, don't you realize how like kind of dumb we all are? I'm not, I wasn't looking at it. You all got, most of you got masks. I can't even tell who you are right now. Ninjas. But you realize how little we know. I don't understand electricity at all. I don't get gravity. I don't understand most things. When Paul says we know in part, how true is that? One day, all we're going to know even as we're known but you know what is not going to stop? You growing in the love of God. That ought to tell you something about how important love really is. Love is the thing that God is doing in our lives that is going to continue on for eternity. And in the ages to come, 10,000 years, we love to use the number 10,000 because it was in a hymn, but you know, all these years... You're still going to be learning about the love of God. 
right when you believe you got it, like, I get, man, God really loves me. And then he's going to just wave us over again with another bit of his love. And you're going to go, oh my gosh, I could swim in that for a long time. This is deep. I didn't realize. I had no idea. Isn't it beautiful that even though knowledge will cease because we will know even as we are known, but the experience of the depth of the love of God will not cease. It will continue. Love is what connects us to eternity, to heaven. The gifts, the activities of our faith will not. Those are going to stop. At some point, nobody's going to be like, can I pray for you in Jesus' name? You're like, no, I'm going to let Jesus do that right now. I'm in heaven. I'm going to let Jesus pray for me. How about we sit down and have a devotion about Jesus? No, let's just invite him into this thing. But love, love will never cease. Now, I want you to notice again in verse 9, there's a word that Paul uses that I think is really important. He says this, for we know in part. And then he says it again, we prophesy in part. He uses this word several different times. We know in part. We prophesy in part. Later, I know in part. Part. It means to be, it, it is a piece of something. It is not the whole thing, but it is a part. And I want to look at this from a, like maybe several different angles, okay? What does it mean to be part? You and I are a part of the body of Christ. Now, that has many implications. That's a, that's a sense of identity. You belong to the body of Christ. You belong to God if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. You are a part. You belong to something. And I'll expand that in just a moment. But here's the other side of that. You are only a part. You are not the whole. Calvary San Diego is not the whole. No one church is the whole. We are a part of God's bigger work that he is accomplishing in this world after generation, after generation, after generation. I am a part. Who are my puzzle people? Who likes to do puzzles? The 500-piece puzzles, the 1,000. Raise your hands. Be proud. Bunch of crazy weirdos. No, no, I'm just kidding. Come on. Uh, I'm just kidding, right? You get the puzzle. It, it must be a personal hell to have a 1,000-piece puzzle and only have 998 pieces. You ever had that happen? That's just like, yep, send it back. I want my money back right now, right? You are a part you are one piece in something that God is doing in the big picture. That is both, that is two things, and I've already said them, but now let me use this analogy. That means you alone don't give the full picture of who and what God is trying to accomplish. You're a part. But it also means you have a part to play in God's kingdom. You don't, you are not of no value. Your value is found in the fact that you are a part, but it's also healthy to remember you are only a part. Both of these are true. And what's going to hold you and me together? Because my part and your part and your part and your part might not really fit that well together at times. Does that mean that we're not all a part? What's going to hold us together is the love of God. You see, I might be at one piece of that, of that puzzle and I find other pieces that fit in where I'm at. And then I see other pieces and they're on the whole other side of the board. They don't fit in with me at all. Doesn't mean they're not a part. They're still a part of the kingdom of God. We use this word part to mean, to mean both a positive and the negative. I, I belong, but I'm not the whole. Let me use this in a, let me flip this and look at it in a different way. I'm going to use the same word, part, but we're going to add a, a, a letter. You ready? Party. Just a Y. I said it like it was more than that, but it's not. Party. Right? Party. What's the great thing about a party? Isn't it great? Do you remember when you were a kid and you get invited to a party? It was the greatest feeling ever. You got invited. Now, we get older, and aren't you glad when you don't get invited to parties? That's, that's the age thing, when you know you're at the age and you're like, and somebody says, oh, there was a party. And you're like, oh, yes, I didn't have to go, right? <laughs> you know, I didn't have to go. But when you're a kid, 
Isn't it devastating to not get invited to a party? And when you're a parent, your kid doesn't get invited to a party, you're ready for World War III? You're like, how could my kid not? We got to be fair to everybody, right? We hate the idea of just like, but we love it if we're on the inside. We just hate it when we're on the outside. Oh, it was a party for just a small group. Yay, I got in. If you didn't, you're like, how dare they? This is how we are. Because we want to be on the inside, and we hate the idea of being on the outside. But the very nature of a party is that you get to invite who you want. And I want you to think about it like this. God invited you to be a part of his thing. You're a part of his, I guess I'll use it, party. You're a part of that. But the very nature of being a part of something means you are not the whole. We know right now, in part, I think this bothers many people, and I want to speak to this. Because often we, we see ourselves, and especially, you know, we got the Bible. We, like, we should be the most knowledgeable people on the planet. Quite often we are not the most knowledgeable people on the planet. But we have this idea of, oh, you know, um, I've got the Bible, so I, you know, we know stuff. And today, today's society, everybody loves to, not everybody, many people love to be the ones to impart knowledge. Did you know? Did you know? I got to tell you this. Did you know? We're like, yeah, dude, we all got the news like you, you know? Did you hear about that? Who did not hear about that? Right? We all, but we want to be the ones that impart knowledge. But you know what Paul says here? You know in part. And what that means is this. You and I need a healthy dose of reality that we don't know all things. As much as we might know about a few things, we do not know all things. And even the few things that we think we know, we probably don't know as well as we think we do. Let that logic spin in your head a little bit. Right, Socrates, he said, I know that I am wiser than you because I know that I know nothing. The wisdom of philosophy there, right? I know I'm smarter than you because I just know that I don't know anything. And, and there's this idea that, if I, that I know something when the truth is, is that we are very limited in what we truly, truly know. And I want to talk to this, I want to speak to this in a moment, but I want you to see this next part of what Paul says here. Paul says that when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's interesting because Jesus encourages you and me to have faith, like like to come to him like a child. So Paul's not contradicting Jesus by saying, I used to be a kid, but now I've grown up and I'm a giant of the faith. That's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that as I'm journeying, as I'm moving in my relationship with God, I'm laying aside immature things. And I'm picking up things that are you know, true and mature. Do you remember when you were, maybe when you were a kid, or when your kids were at this place, so you have to decide... Do you remember that moment, and I'll, I'll speak as a dad here, but maybe you remember when you were a kid, when that, that year that you didn't want toys anymore for Christmas or birthday? Oh, man, that breaks a parent's heart. What do you want for Christmas? Money. Oh. You don't want a doll? You don't want a truck? You don't want this game or anything? No, I just want money. I just want to get clothes, and I don't want you to buy the clothes because you have terrible taste. Just give me money. They don't say those words, but it's all true. Just give me cash. You don't know what you're doing. Just give dollars. <laughs> right? And it's kind of that, like, it's that for, for, for parents, it can be that sad moment of, oh, man. Then you get over it, and you're like, here's money. Just go. It's fine. But that childish thing disappears. That moment when you realize either it's you remembering you or you as a parent remembering your kid, you realize they're not a child anymore. And of course, that begins the rocky years of they're kind of still childish, but they're growing up. And we're all supposed to be growing up. We're putting aside things that are immature, and we're gravitating, and we're holding on to that which is mature. And what is that? Well, it's an identity that says, I realize that I know in part today. It's a humility that says, I know that I don't know. I'm okay with that. 
And, and we're struggling with this today. Excuse me. We're really struggling with this today because we're struggling with the idea that, but that's what I've known. I've always known it like this. And people are like, wait, maybe it wasn't like that. Maybe, your, maybe what you learn, maybe what you think, maybe your idea isn't exactly the way it used to be. Maybe it's, and I'm talking about our history. I'm talking about your relationships. Like, I thought I was okay with this person. And they say, no, actually, we were having a hard time. These were good times in my marriage. And your spouse was like, no, not really. Right? We all, we think we know, but we really don't know. And we're all, here's the hard part. Everybody's getting mad about it. I know this is how it was. I know what this is. How do you know? How do you know? Let me, let me just give an example, and I'm going to kind of wrap it to the end of this. I mean, the Bible is the only book that we have that is certainly the truth of God's word. It's certainly true. But do you understand that for centuries, the church got it wrong on many key fundamental doctrinal truths? Let me just throw out a really big one. You ready? Salvation. We got it wrong for like a thousand years. We taught the church, I should say, in the name of God, taught that you must be a good person to go to heaven. But if you die and you weren't that great, don't worry, your family can pay money to get you out of hell. Friends, that's a thousand years of a 2,000 year old church. 50% of the time, we got it wrong. So please, you cannot tell me that you couldn't get, that we don't get other things wrong. If we're getting the scriptures wrong at times, you can't tell me we're not getting everything else wrong. You can't tell me we're not. And I'll give an example of that in just a moment. Um, but let me go back to this, this idea of like how, where we got scriptures wrong. And of course, the bio, or history tells us that about, you know, in the 1400s, there was this move among uh, many uh, monks in, in Europe, mainly German. You got, we all know Martin Luther. And their, the move was this. They started reading the Bible again. Just reading the Bible. And they realized, I think we're getting this wrong. We've been telling people that if they're good... Or they could pay money and they could get to heaven. But the Bible says that we're justified by faith. We, we've messed this one up. And it changed the whole course of human history. It changed everything. Friends, if they were wrong at that time, they knew in part and were still figuring things out. We are not in 2020 the ultimate expression of right. We are not. We're still figuring stuff out. Aren't there things that you were so certain of 10 years ago that you're kind of like, yeah, it's really not that big of a deal now? I hope so. I hope so. Let me just, let me, let me mention one more idea about the, the idea of childlike versus childish. There's something that, you know, I'll just use the example of our, our, my pastor Chuck Smith, before he died, he held a childlikeness that I thought, I want to be like that when I'm old like him. When I'm 82, 83, however, 90, whatever, it doesn't matter. There was this sense of, I still believe that God wants to work in the world and through my life right now. I still have hope that I'm going to experience God's victory, as we sang earlier. I still believe in these things. Sadly for so many, if we don't walk in love, we stop seeing people, we start seeing issues, and we get bitter, we get cranky, and we isolate, and we, we just find the pieces of the puzzle that fit with my piece of the puzzle, and we miss that there's other pieces of the puzzle that don't fit with my piece, but they're a part of the big picture of what God is trying to do. And we just get comfortable with our bit of the, 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 the puzzle. But friends, the beauty of the puzzle is not just in that microscopic look of a few pieces. It's seen in the big picture of all that God is and wants to accomplish in and through his people. And we get to be a part. So we want to be childlike, not childish. Childlike, but not childish. Don't let your truth, apart from the word of God, don't let your truth be something you're going you're gonna to stand on, 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 on this. I'm going to, I, I will not budge from this thing. That's what I see a lot of right now. This is the truth. Are you sure? Because so far, everything besides the word of God has been proven to be maybe a little bit different than the way you thought about it. One of my favorite Bible teachers growing up, he, and I shared this with you, he, had, he taught a Bible study and then a lady came to him and said, you've got to listen to this, this message 
this is how old the story is. She gave him a cassette tape. If you're 20, those are a thing that we used to have. They're, they were like, yay, big. Anyways, you could Google that. Google cassette tape. And she gave him a cassette tape, and she said, listen to this message, because this pastor completely disagrees with everything that you just said. And he's like, man, I'm excited. And he looked at the cassette tape, and it said his name from 10, 15 years earlier. Why? He had grown. He had changed. He developed. He understood things better than he did at that point. Friends, I pray that the gospel never allows you and me to become so stagnant that we don't continue to grow. And most of all, that we continue to grow in the love of God. That's why we're going to end today by taking communion. And so I'm going to invite the worship team. Feel free to come on up again. And um, we've got the elements of communion on the tables up front and also the tables in the back. I'll just give a practical, if you feel like, you know, you don't want to be crowding with other people, wait. <laughs> just wait a little bit or go to the back. Nobody, nobody goes back there as much and grab it. And just be aware of the fact that I'm a- here's what I'm asking you to consider right now. I'm asking you to consider this as an act of humility, okay? Not just like, yeah, this is what we do, because guess what? We haven't done this in how many months? It's been a while, right? It's been a while. We did that at home, and if you're watching online, I'm giving you time. That's what I feel like I'm doing. Race to the fridge, grab something to drink, and grab something to eat, and you're going to take communion with us as well. And we're going to just pause and we're going to acknowledge something as a point of humility. I believe that taking communion is an act of humility. And that's the best way that you and I today can say, Lord, I know that I know in part. I don't know the whole. I just know in part. Why? Because I'm going to come up here and I'm going to take the bread and I'm going to take the cup. And I'm going to remind myself that if it wasn't for what you did, Jesus, I'd be going to hell. All the, all the knowledge, all the, everything I got is nothing compared to what you accomplished for me on a cross. It's an act of humility. It's also an act of worship. Those two things go hand in hand. But as you come forward or as you go to the back, can I just remind you, take on the posture of humility. If it weren't for the Lord, that should be, the, that should be what we're saying as we're walking towards, towards communion table. If it weren't for the Lord if it weren't for Jesus, if it weren't for the cross. Not, yay, I'm going to heaven alone, but if it weren't for what you did, I would have no hope, no life, I'd have nothing. That's how we can today remind ourselves via a posture of humility, I don't know it all, but I thank God that he offered his life for me. Father, thank you so much for the privilege, Lord, that we're having today for those of us that are here in person and those that are online, they get to be a part of this as well. It's exciting. Lord, we get to take communion. We get to remind ourselves as we worship you that, Lord Jesus, we don't know it all. We don't know it all and we need you. I thank you, Jesus, that you died and that you rose again. Lord, I'm thankful that your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we could be healed, so that we could be a part of the whole. We worship you, Lord, as we take communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching our service online. Moving forward at this season, we want to remember these things as a church. We want to remember to be faithful in prayer. Let's pray for those that are sick for those that are at risk, for our government, and for God to just change things. Number two, let us remember to be faithful in service. As Christians, let's lead by serving one another. And finally, let's be faithful in generosity. At these times, we can kind of look inward, living life close-handed. But let's go ahead and look outward and live life open-handed as Christians, helping one another. If you'd like to give to this church, you can do that at calvarysd.com slash give, or you can do that by giving on our Calvary SD app. For a time, we might not be able to gather at church together on Sunday morning, but we can have church anywhere, and we're going to have church online. So be checking out our online services every Sunday morning, and be looking on Instagram, Facebook, and our Calvary SD app for more content during the week. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you soon.